Amen. Amen. Good morning. Welcome to everybody who's online. Uh, it's good to have you with us. Thanks for joining us. I'm just going to move this here so I don't knock it over if I get too excited. Uh, my name is Merle Shank, lead pastor here at Newport Church, if you don't know who I am. And it's awesome to be here worshiping the Lord with you. And I want to encourage you uh, as we go into today's sermon that the Word of God, it is the Word of God that plows away ahead of you in your life. It, it helps to frame your world. We're going to talk about that a little bit today. But I want to, uh, can we just stand, I want to take some time in prayer. I mean, many of you know uh, what has happened in Ukraine. Uh, so let's pray for the church in Ukraine. Can we do that together this morning? We're just going to take a moment, and I want you to pray, you know, scriptures that come to your mind. We're going to do this African style. For those of you who've never been to Africa, Africa style is we just all pray out loud at once. Can we do that? All right, so in Jesus' name, Father, we thank you, God. In Jesus' name, Lord, we thank you for your church in the Ukraine. Father, we pray, Father, that you would break bonds right now. I pray for uh, just courage and life in Jesus' name. Father, every place, God, that uh, uh, life would be trying to be stolen. Father, we bring you, the nation of Ukraine before you today in the name of Jesus Christ. Father, we ask that you would break uh, the bonds of oppression in Jesus' name. Father, I pray, God, for your presence to be uh, with your people. Father, I pray for courage. I pray, God, that fear would not grip. I pray for a divine um, uh, escape in the name of Jesus Christ. God, we bring this nation before you, God, in the name of Jesus Christ. I thank you, Lord, for your love for this nation. I thank you, Lord, for your love for the Ukrainian people and your love even for the Russian people, Father. Lord, those in this, in this central block, God, we ask in Jesus' name that your kingdom would come, your peace would come in the name of Jesus Christ. God, we ask, Lord, that you would arrest, Lord, uh, the, a spirit of murder, God, a spirit that's trying to take lives in the name of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. God, we thank you, Lord. Father, we ask that you would release angels from heaven, God. We ask, Lord, that you would release your word today, God. We, we thank you, Lord, God, for divine uh, escapes, divine opportunities, Lord, for people to, to uh, uh, get out of trouble, get out of harm's way in the name of Jesus Christ. Father, I ask, Lord, that you would give courage to church leaders. Father, you would give courage, Lord, to people who are on the ground uh, trying to help, Father, trying to uh, take care of people who are wounded, trying to take care of people who need help in the name of Jesus Christ. God, we lift this whole situation before you, God. Lord, even when we don't know how to pray, Holy Spirit, we ask that you would lead us in prayer. I thank you, Lord God, that your word would break the, the back of the enemy, would break the back, Father, of, of the devil that comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Father, you come to bring life, and so we declare life over the nation of Ukraine this morning. We declare life.
In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Psalms 89 verse 14 says, Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Steadfast love and faithfulness go before you. Blessed are the people who know the joyful sound, who walk, O Lord, in the light of your countenance or in the light of your face. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you, God, that we can come before your throne. Father, the place of righteousness and justice, the place that where righteousness and justice comes from, and we can declare your peace, we can declare your kingdom in the name of Jesus Christ, in Jesus' name, amen, 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 amen. You may be seated. Thank you for praying with us uh, this morning. Um, so as we are in this, this third message, if you would like to follow along with me in the app, uh, there, there are notes already in the app to this sermon, and you can go ahead and, and add more uh, notes as you desire as well uh, if you want to follow along with us this morning in the church app. So we're going to be talking about encountering God in prayer. Now remember that this is one of the foundations of Newport Church. It's one of the foundations, I believe, of the Christian faith is that we encounter God in prayer. We encounter God in worship. We encounter God in his word. We encounter God in ministry one to another and in community. And we encounter God as we reach out. These are areas that we can expect and have faith to encounter God's presence in. Amen. And so as we go, as we're teaching through this, and, we're, and this is the third message in our series, of encountering God in prayer, I want to talk about the Word of God, and I want to talk about why it's important to pray the Word of God, and how, it's, how that actually affects our lives, and how that can change things. Now, many people will say, oh, prayer is powerful, and many people would say amen, but listen, there, there's, there's times where, uh, how many of you have ever felt like your prayers were not even getting out of the room? A few of you. Or a few honest people. <laughs> okay, there's times like that you feel like that, and so there. What I wanna, uh, what I wanna do is I wanna kind of recalibrate and say, listen, what is it that we pray that makes our prayers effective, that makes our prayer life come alive. And that's my desire is that every person would have a thriving prayer life. Every person would be able to encounter God and know how to encounter his presence. Now listen, you know, we've had some wonderful services here on a Sunday morning. You know, the last several Sunday mornings, you know, the presence of the Lord was, was thick and his glory was in the room. It's awesome. It's wonderful. And, and, and though in those times, you know, we pray for healing and we pray for, for victory, we pray for different, you know, for things to happen like that, healing and deliverance and the gifts of the Holy Spirit, that's not the purpose of his presence being here. The purpose of his manifest presence being here is to be with us and for us to be with him and to love on him. And so the, the, minute we, we're, the minute we start to encounter God and we start to say, oh, we can use this. Like, God, I, can, I could really use some of this, you know. Like, do this for me or do this for me. Or I'm ex our, what happens is we, our attention shifts and comes off of the presence of the Lord and our love relationship with him and the steadfastness of his covenant with us and his ability and our ability to connect and relate and, and walk together and all of a sudden, we're looking about what he can do for us. Now, there, there are the benefits of serving the Lord. But I, I think, you know, uh, one thing that the Lord wants to lead us in is just in relationship with him. It's in the depths of relationship with him. And so, Father, I just ask, Lord, that every, every wall, every challenge, every uh, impediment to depths of relationship with you, Father, would just start to crumble now by the power of the blood of Jesus Christ. Every expectation, Father, where we say we want you to do this before we surrender our lives or anything like that, God, just let it fall now in the presence of the Lord in the name of Jesus Christ. I thank you, God, that you have called us to walk in the light of your countenance, and Father, that we can know the joyful sound. We can know the joyful shout, Father, that the King is in our midst in Jesus' name. Amen. So as we're looking back, remember the very first um, sermon that we started with, we talked about the miraculous Christian life is actually the normal Christian life. Amen? 
the miraculous Christian life is the normal Christian life. There's a lot of experiences in here. There's a lot of, of encounters in the Word of God that display to us what a normal Christian life is like. Remember that we don't get our um, definition of normal from our experience because God didn't say, Hey, Matt, you're now the standard of Christianity. Or Merle, you're not the standard of Christian. You're now the standard of Christianity. That's not God. Never said that. The standard of Christianity is His Word. Amen. The standard for what life in Christ can be like is His Word. Amen. So we we talked about the miraculous Christian life is the normal Christian life. When we kicked off this steer, this series, the next message we talked about in this series was about um, uh, the place that we pray from. In other words, we pray from victory, not for victory, right? We're just going through some recap here, right? So so that's... um that's what we talked about, that being in Christ, that place of being in him, of being situated in him, is the place that gives us authority, is the place that gives us the right to encounter him and the right to, uh, for our, our prayers to be effective in the land and in the nations and in our lives. Amen. And then uh, a couple weeks ago, um, uh, how many of you enjoyed Jessica Tate, by the way, last week? Yes. Amen. Come on. Fire! <laughs> yes. Amen. So, I, I think, sorry, just a, a sidebar. I think that there's people here that related to her because you're called to do similar things. I think there's, there's, there's people here that are like, man, there's something that she was ministering out of that sparked a fire in me. And I want to encourage you to not let that go. If that was you, if that's true, you know, sometimes God will give us a flash forward for something that we're called for, and we actually identify it in other people or other men and women of God. Like, as they minister, we're like, man, that's, that's, that's a picture, right? And it doesn't mean that you're called to be them. It just means that God shows you, and there's something that is in their heart that ignites in your heart. And so don't let that go, but pay the price and do uh, what it takes to become effective in what God is calling you to do. Amen? Sidebar. Okay. Coming back to the main bar. The salad bar. No, just kidding. <laughs> the place that you pray from, how you position and posture yourself in your mind and in your spirit, how you are in Christ as you pray, many times affects um, the outcome of your prayers, the place where you pray from, the place where you start has a huge impact on the place where you wind up in your prayer life. So, and then uh, a couple weeks ago, we talked about God leading us in prayer, how the Holy Spirit is the one who knows best how to touch God's heart. He knows who, what is in God's heart, and the Holy Spirit actually leads us in prayer to see God's kingdom come. And the Holy Spirit will actually pray through us, right? That's what praying in tongues is. That's where uh, the Holy Spirit is leading us to speak mysteries to God. Remember we talked about uh, speaking in tongues is like perfect prayer. Our mind is, doesn't know what's going on, but our spirit man is edified, and that's built up. That's what the Bible talks about. And so we, we went through all of that. Now, I want to talk about why God has us pray this morning. And so today we're going to look at encountering God in prayer and specifically in how he writes us into his eternal will as we engage the world and the spirit realm with his word. That was a big sentence. <laughs> okay, How he writes us into his eternal will as we engage the world around us and the spirit realm with his word. I want to talk about that. We're going to talk about spiritual warfare a little bit this morning. And my prayer this morning is that each one of us will walk out of here with a, a fresh authority and a fresh confidence in power and prayer. And to see deliverance happen, to see results happen from our prayers in our lives, okay? Jesus, when he taught us to pray, he taught us, and the first scripture we're going to look at here is in Matthew chapter 6. And Jesus says this, he says, when you pray... Do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard because of their many words. So Jesus is saying, listen, don't, don't just, you know, 
repeat things that you hear other people praying, it has to be true. It has to be authentic to your heart and to your life and to your understanding of the word, okay? That's, that's my paraphrase, okay? There, there has to be a place of authenticity before God. And so, and then he goes on and says, do not be like them for your father knows what you need before you ask him. Verse 9, pray then like this, our father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your heavenly Father forgive you your trespasses. Okay, so let's look at this. Let's, let's go into this and allow this to impact our lives. Number one, the, the, this prayer for many people has become just a repetitive prayer. Right after Jesus says, don't let, don't pray just non, you know, nonsensical words that doesn't mean anything to you. What have we done as people? <laughs> what have we done? Yeah, you know, it's just human nature. We're like, okay. All right, this is how you pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. You know, and it's not like it, we're not encountering God in that. You know, because, listen, number one, I mean, you can go into this, and there's tons of preachings on this. I know that, that Larry Kreider has a good preaching on, you know, the rooms of prayer, how every phrase here is like a, a room that you can spend time with in God. Number one, God being our Father and going into that place of God, you know, my sonship or my daughtership is with you. You know, there, there's this place of encountering with God as a Father, and you can spend, a, we can spend a whole sermon or a whole series just on that. And then, holy is your name, the fact that God is holy, he's set apart, you know, going into that, and, and, and listen, all those things we're called to unpack, but, but uh, the thing is this, that God wants us, and we need to pray. We need to encounter him in prayer. Jesus says, don't be like them, for your Father knows what you need even before you ask him. So don't use empty words and phrases in prayers, right? Verse 8, God wants us to ask. God wants us to ask. It's interesting that if God knows what we need even before we ask, yet he still asks, he still wants us to ask, right? There's two things. One, I, I believe it affects us when we come to a place of knowing what uh, to ask in our prayer life. But there's also a point where the will of God taking place in our life is dependent on how we engage him. It's dependent on how we engage with the word of God. So if God is supreme, why does God want us to ask? Why does he want us to ask? If he knows all these things, why does he want us to ask in order for his will to be accomplished? We could even go a step further, and many do, of, 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 of going into what I call religious fatalism. Like, well... What will be, will be, and, and the only thing I need to pray is for myself to be able to, like, make it through whatever situation is handed to me. Now, we do need to pray for ourselves, but listen, you're called to be effective in prayer that actually changes the world around you, okay? So there's this thing in, in religious circles and, and you know, uh, where people even become like hyper-Calvinists, where God has predetermined everything, even to the point of salvation and hell and who goes to hell and who goes to heaven, and, and everything in your life is already predetermined, and it's not. It's not, because, listen, we have tons of examples in Scripture of how to pray, where their pray prayers changed the course of what happened. Their prayers changed the course, and listen, our nation needs our prayers to change some courses. The nations of the world need the prayers of the kingdom of God to change some courses right now. Yeah? This is super relevant. We see in Acts chapter 12, when Peter was thrown into prison, we see that the church, that, I mean, right before then, James had been killed. He had been, uh, he had been killed by Herod, and Peter was thrown into prison. Herod was expecting to do the exact same thing, and the Bible says in Acts chapter 12 that the church prayed all night for him. All night. They prayed together all night. 
for him. And what happened? An angel came and delivered Peter out of prison. Acts chapter 10, verse 31, we see Cornelius' prayers. He, where he, uh, the, the, an angel shows up in his room and said, listen, your prayers and your alms, the giving to the poor, that's what alms is, your prayers and your alms have come up before God as a memorial and now send to Joppa for a man whose name is Peter and tells him, gives all these instructions. And God orchestrates a divine encounter where the Gentiles for the very first time that we know of and is recorded in scripture comes into the kingdom of God. Why? Because of his prayer. Because of his prayer life and his, his, uh, his heart to give and be generous. Acts chapter 9, Tabitha or, or Dorcas, depending on uh, what translation you have, was already dead. And God used Peter's prayers to raise her back to life. Intervention in prayer. 1 Thessalonians 5, 2 Thessalonians 3. Paul says, pray for us. Brothers, pray for us. Well, why was Paul needing prayer if it was already predetermined? Pray for us that an effectual door would be open, that an effectual door for the ministry would be open. We see Romans 15. You have all the notes there in the app. There, there's tons of, of, of scriptures. Romans 15, 30 to 32. 2 Corinthians 1, 10 to 11. Ephesians 6, uh, 18 to 20. Philippians 1, 19. Colossians 4, uh, 2 to 4. Philemon 1, 22. The writer of Hebrews in, in Hebrews 13. Why are we so commanded to pray? If it's all predetermined already, and the answer is because it's not predetermined in our lives. There are things that by the will of God, he has determined. And so let's look at that, but there's much that is not. There's much that is not. So I want to talk about this here because many times I think we become fatalistic in our prayers, or maybe we pray for something and we haven't seen it happen yet, and then we kind of just back off and we're like, well, you know, I prayed three times and it didn't happen. Where we're called to stand as a fortress and pray and declare to see the kingdom of God come in our generation and in our lives. So we need to pray because there are many things that are available to us, but they're not necessarily guaranteed to us. It's dependent on us. There's many things that are available to us as believers and as Christians, but they're not guaranteed. It's dependent on us. It's dependent on our life. So pardon me as I geek out or as I Greek out here, okay? I want to give you two Greek words. There are more Greek words for the will of God, but I want to give you two Greek words for the will of God. The first one being thelema. Thelema is translated, when it's, tr- when it's talking about God and his will, it's translated as uh, that which means to be determined. So that is God determining. Sorry, he's just taking pictures around me. <laughs> anyway. Thelema, back to Thelema. Here we go. All right. Thelema, it, it means God has determined it. Okay? That's that Greek word. And where, when it's used within connection with the will of God, we see these, these things are things that God has determined beforehand. Matthew chapter 26, verse 42. Again, the second time. This is when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane. Um, Again, the second time he went and he prayed and he said, My father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will, your thelema, your predetermined will be done. Right? Now, he actually had a choice with that. He could have bailed and said, Nope, I'm not going to do it. All right? Okay, that's the first Greek word, but that's, that's the will of God that is predetermined from before time. God says this will happen. There are certain things that are going to happen in the nations. There are certain things that are going to happen uh, in time that God says I've predetermined it. Now the next word is this, bolamai, and it's translated as willing. It's, it's also translated as a will, but it's really uh, meaning like the desire the desire of God or the purpose for God or the, the purpose with which God created something. And, and it's, it's uh, bolamite. It doesn't mean necessarily that it's determined as much as it means uh, within the context, it means God's heart, his purpose, his desire. We see this in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. It says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish but that all should come to repentance. So, 
God's not willing that any should perish, but are people perishing? Yeah. And the fact, you know, there, there, there's, there's the obedience factor of the church that's at play here. When God says, I'm not willing for this to happen. God's will, it, it, you know, God's, God's not willing for Ukrainian people to die and Russian people to die. But it's happening. Because nations have allowed it to happen. Anyway. So people are perishing. The results very much have to do with our involvement. Luke chapter 22, verses 42, we actually see both of these words, uh, thelema and uh, bolamai, bolamai, used when Jesus is, is praying in the garden again. He says, Father, if you are willing, if it's your desire, let this cup pass, remove this cup from me. But nevertheless, not my thelema, not my will, but yours be done. Sometimes God's will is actually determined already but how it applies to our lives is dependent upon how we accept it and how we engage with it. All right? And this many times has to do with our prayer life. And if we don't, if we don't come into alignment with God's word in prayer, we miss stuff. We miss what's possible in the kingdom of God. There's nobody's fault really but our own. Okay, we see that even when the Greek word thelema is used, we can also, there's still a choice. There, there's still the choice involved when it comes to human interaction with the predetermined will of God. Matthew chapter 21, verse 28 to 31 says this. It says, but, when you do, uh, but what do you think? A man has two sons. And he came to the first and said, son, go work today in my vineyard. And he said, I will not. But afterward, he regretted it and went. And then he came to the second and said, likewise. And he answered, said, I go, sir, but he did not go. Which of the two did the will of the father? Which of the two did the dilemma of the father? The one who was obedient? The one who was obedient? So there's things that God has willed for our generation, but it takes our obedience. It takes our risk. It takes our faith. It takes a cost from us to see it come for our generation. The point is that God, God has a predetermined will, and it's going to happen. The question is, is it going to happen in our life? Is it going to happen in our family? Is it going to happen in our church? Is it going to happen in our nation, in our region? God desires for our lives our dependent, uh, sorry, God's desires, his heart for our lives is dependent upon our decision to engage them. Okay? It's not going to happen without our engagement. It's not going to happen without our faith. Our prayer life and how we pray it has a huge impact on what happens in our lives and also how we get through what happens in our lives. That's our prayer life. The Holy Spirit leads us in relevant scriptures. So many times, um, as we, we talked uh, last time, um, two weeks ago, about the Holy Spirit leading us in prayer and how he actually takes us through. And, and many times, the Holy Spirit, when you're praying, there will be, you'll get an impression about a scripture or you'll remember a Bible story. Go and research that at that time. Because many times, God is giving you a key at that point for how you should pray, or how you should posture yourself, or how you should interact. This happened uh, to me. Uh, I have a journal entry. Now, I'm not a good journal. I'm not a good journal writer, journaler. I'm terrible at journaling. There's like seven per year, you know. <laughs> Anybody else with me? Okay. All right. God loves you too. Amen. <laughs> you know. But, but I, I have a journal entry uh, because it was so profound on January 16, 2020, uh, we were actually having a time of prayer here at the church, and God had taken me to Mark chapter 4, verse 35, the whole way to 5, verse 20, and, and we're, we're not going to read that now, but it's where Jesus is crossing the Red Sea 
he's crossing the Sea of Galilee. Sorry, not the Red Sea. The Sea of Galilee. And he's going to the Gadarenes. And he knows what he's about to do. He's going to deliver not just a man who was at, in the tombs who had cut himself and was crazy and demon-possessed. Remember that guy, right? But he was going to deliver an entire region. Jesus knew what he was going to do because what happened? The man who was demon-possessed got delivered. And the, the demons said, let us go into the pigs, right? And then the pigs ran off a cliff and died. In the sea, they drowned, right? Remember that? So Jews were not allowed to have pigs. So there was a whole economic system that there was a lot of pigs that were, were there was a whole economic system of that area that was unrighteous that actually wound up getting judged by the deliverance of this one guy, right? And those people came and they said, Jesus, get out of here. Go, leave, get out of here. And what did Jesus do? He actually left, but he, when the guy who was delivered wanted to come with Jesus, Jesus said, no, stay here and show yourself to everybody. Tell them what has happened. The next time that Jesus comes back into that region, back into the Decapolis, the ten cities, he's welcomed there. What, what changed between the time where he was rejected and people were saying, get out of here. We don't want you. You're some kind of sorcerer. You're some kind of, you know, like whatever. And, and cast, you know, tell him to get out. What happened between then and when he was welcomed the next time he came back into the Decapolis? The testimony of the demoniac who was delivered. That's what happened. And so a whole region is going to get delivered. Economic systems are gonna, that are unrighteous are going to crash. And righteousness is going to be restored and the heart to, to receive Jesus is going to be built up again because of the testimonies of what he's done in people's lives. Right? Okay. So that was uh, in prayer. The Lord took me into that place. And I saw this. The scripture is where the storm is arising in the boat. And Jesus knows what he's going to do. He's going to deliver a region, but the storm is rising and the disciples are saying, Don't you care about us? We're going to die. You know, don't you care about us? And Jesus, so we see the difference that Jesus, he knows what he's called to do. He knows what he's going to do. But the disciples only see the storm. The disciples only see the storm. And they're freaked out by what's happening around them. And so in, in, a, in that picture, the Lord led a, me and led a few others to pray into that. And Jesus, um, the sense was that when we were praying, that God was going to shake things up. This was January 16th, 2020, two months before COVID hits the United States, right? The sense was that God was going to shake things up and that his heart to set and deliver regions and territories. There was a big storm coming because Jesus was on his way to deliver a region. The storm was the pushback of spiritual strongholds trying to resist the mission of deliverance that Jesus was on. It would result in unrighteous economic systems being judged and collapsing. And though the people of the region were dependent upon these economic systems, would initially reject Jesus, those people would turn around because of the, the result and the testimony of those who encountered Christ would be moved to receive him and be ready to receive him. So also, as the boats were heading into the storm, Jesus was focused on what he knew God had called him to do, and he was not worried about the storm. However, the disciples only saw the storm and were afraid. So all of us, like we were just praying, right? And that picture comes, and boom, go, goes to that scripture. But that really, that and like a, a one or two other encounters really framed the, like how to posture ourselves, whatever came. We didn't know what was coming right? But the Lord led us in how to posture ourselves, saying, listen, God, we're going to be about your kingdom. We're not, we're not going to get caught up in the fear that's happening all around us, whatever's happened, the fear of the storm. We're going to be focused on what you have called us to do. We're going to continue to share the gospel. We're going to continue to give our testimony because that's who Christians are. That's what Christians do, right? And that actually helped to frame our posture going through these last two years. Now, do I believe we're 
we're through it the whole way. I don't, I actually don't think we're through, we're, th- you know, through that picture the whole way. I think there's still, still things that are crumbling um, that will continue to crumble, but I believe that the, the result of testimonies, of your testimony and my testimony, and many other testimonies of believers are going to reap a harvest for the kingdom of God. Yeah? And so, um, you know, that kind of helped to the Holy Spirit, through that picture of prayer, help to frame the context for what we were about to walk into. Does that make sense? All right? The Holy Spirit will do that for you over and over and over again. So pay attention to the scriptures that pop up, that surface in your heart as you're praying. The, it, it, there's a divine advantage <laughs> that comes to believers because of their prayer life, because of the Holy Spirit leading them. And as they encounter God in prayer, there's a divine advantage that is our advantage that as the Holy Spirit leads us through to prepare us for whatever comes. Okay, so looking back, we see how those scriptures provided like a blueprint or a map of how to navigate these last couple years. Uh, this was also, there was also an, uh, specifically another set of scriptures that we're not going to go into right now that really gave us, honestly, uh, gave me the strategy for how we were going to respond to like lockdowns and mandates and all of those things. And, and so um, the Lord was just... That's how the Lord leads us in prayer. He gives us a divine advantage. There's things like when, when you're praying for your business and, and, and a scenario floats to, a scriptural scenario floats to the surface of your heart, to your awareness. Many times that's the Lord who, who it doesn't mean that everything's going to line up with that biblical story, right? We're not trying to read ourselves into scripture in that sense. But that many times there's a key that God wants to give you that's in that story that's effective for what you need to go through what you're about to go through. Amen? That's how the Holy Spirit will lead us and lead you in prayer is the Lord wants to give you keys. He wants to give you revelation. All of a sudden, and it doesn't always come right away. It's like, man, like you you study it out. You study it out, and then all of a sudden you find yourself in a situation where like, that's what that was. That's what God was saying. And there's been times where... um, uh, Shree and I, we, were, we would be talking, and something that the Lord had, had spoken to us a month or two before, all of a sudden we find ourselves in the context where that's relevant, and, and automatically you have a blueprint, or you have uh, the, the way that you're supposed to respond because of what God had shared with you months before, even though you, didn't, you had no idea until that moment. And that's how the Holy Spirit leads his people. That's, how, that's what a prayer life does is as we walk with the Lord, there's a lot of things we don't know. There's a lot of things we don't receive. There's a lot of th- scriptures that come up and, like, and it's just like, hmm, I don't know. I don't understand that scripture right away or I don't understand that dream right away. There's things that the Lord gives to you. But you take it and you hold it in tension and you say, okay, I'm going to, Lord, I, 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 I receive this from you, but I don't understand it yet. Have, have you ever had this happen where all of a sudden you're just going through life and boom, the keys that were in that revelation, the keys that were in that scripture all of a sudden apply to your life. And it's the divine advantage of believers. Every one of us is called to that. You don't have to be some super saint <laughs> somewhere, right? That's what encountering God in prayer does. When we pray his word, when we receive his word in prayer. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 3 says this. It says, by faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen were not made from things that are visible. So when God's word comes, it helps to frame our world. It means it defines the boundaries of our world. So that's how we know we can pray God's word because the word of God defines the boundaries of what should happen and what shouldn't happen. And anything that is happening outside of those boundaries of the word of God, that's what our job to bring into alignment with the word of God. That's our job to pray because anything that's happening outside of the framing of God's word needs to come into alignment and bow before him. 
and bow before his word. So it defines what is allowed and what's not allowed. And anything that's different than the foundation of the word of God in our lives and society must bow and move aside. And that is our battle. It's, it's, not, it's not just instantaneous all the time, but that's where we stand. What the Bible talks about having, you know, stand therefore. We are standing in the word of God. We're saying, Lord, we are pushing for your kingdom to come, your will to be done in our generation, in our government, in our region, in our families, in our schools. That's what we stand for. God, we call it forth. God, we stand in agreement with your word. We give, Lord, and and we just keep praying, right? Some old-timers call it praying through, right, where you pray through something. You keep praying, you keep pushing until you see it happen, right? (laughs) Push, pray until something happens. There we go. Okay. So not only does the word of God frame and form the boundaries of our lives, but Ephesians chapter 6 verse 17 says that the word of God is the sword of the spirit. It is the offensive warfare, it is the offensive weapon that God gives to us is his word as we pray. The word of God is the offensive weapon in the spirit realm. It's how we stand against principalities and powers and rulers in heavenly realms, which the Bible calls us to do. We don't stand against them with our own ideas, with our own good looks, <laughs> you know. We don't stand in our own authority. No, no, we use the word of God as the sword of the spirit that cuts in, that's, that's sharper than any two-edged sword, that divides even to the soul, the point of soul and marrow, or bone and marrow, soul and spirit, all right? So we use um, the word of God in our lives as we declare his kingdom coming into our every situation that we're fighting. As believers, we have this responsibility. We have the responsibility to bind and to loose. That's our job. To bind and to loose. Matthew chapter 16, verses 18 and 19. And I say to you, this is Jesus speaking to Peter, that you are Peter and on this rock I will build my church and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loose in heaven. Peter just had the revelation that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God. This is the first time that Jesus actually uses the word church. Okay, as we, as we use it today in the English language, um, it was the first time he used the word ecclesia, uh, what we is translated church. And Jesus says that what you bind and loose, what you allow on earth <laughs> will be allowed in heaven. Many times people, people think it's, it's what we bind in the heavenlies will be bound on earth. That's not what he said. Jesus said, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Matthew 18, verse 18 and 20 says, Assuredly, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you that if two or three agree on earth concerning anything that they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For there, where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. This is dealing in the context of an unrepentant brother. But there's this place of coming into agreement with God's word where we come together and we pray and we ask God, but then we have to go out and do. So both scriptures, this is the time, this is the only times that Jesus actually uses the word church. And both scriptures, it, it, uh, and it, 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 it's talking about the church that where it's our place, it's our job to bind and loose. How do we bind and loose? Well, in Matthew 18, we see that there, it's in the context of, the, of prayers of agreement, but we come together as a church to pray for the will of God to be manifest. But then whatever we bind on earth is bound in heaven. This is not just prayer, but this is where prayer turns into action. It's not just that you pray, but it's how you vote. It's how you conduct your business. It's how you work out the decisions of your life. I get a little nervous when someone's prayer life isn't reflected in their decision making. 
our prayer life, an accurate prayer life, should cause us to make good decisions. Because that's what's happening. That's what happens. So sometimes, so what, what we allow and what we disallow on earth will actually is released in the spirit realm, both positive and negative. Sometimes you see this where like a ministry where um, the leader is in sin and you'll find that sin running rampant in all the different levels of the ministry. Because what was released by the, nat- by the natural decisions of that leader released it in the spirit realm And all of a sudden, there's that problem. It doesn't mean that everybody was falling for that problem, but they were at least fighting it. Because what's done in the natural affects what is released in the spirit. Okay? This also happens in the positive sense. That if certain leaders have faith for something in ministries, many times you'll see um, the the, the results will, will flesh out in all areas of the ministry. So say somebody has like a prophetic anointing, they have, they have uh, uh, faith for the prophetic. Well, many times that's, that's throughout the whole ministry, that people just have this faith for God to speak, and, or, or maybe it's healing, or maybe it's whatever it is, you know, whatever the faith of leaders, it, trick, it trickles out from there. And it affects all the realms of ministry. So it's both positive and negative. It's, it's based on the decisions and what you actually intend. That's why, we, that's why the enemy is happy to let us pray in circles but never actually get involved in things as the church. That's why the world will be happy for you to pray. Keep your spirituality private. Keep it personal. Listen, the Christian faith is not personal. If you follow Jesus, you will make disciples. (laughs) That's what the Bible says. Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Right? So there's things that, that, that impacts our life. And this is where prayer becomes the reality of what we choose to do, how we choose to apply our time and our resources in our life and what we sacrifice for. This is where prayer turns to decision making. And our prayer life demands a response from ourselves. It's like in Luke 10 where Jesus is telling the disciples in verses 2 and 3. He says, then he said to them, the harvest is truly great, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray for the, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. What's the next sentence? Go. Go your way. Therefore, so there's this place where we pray, we pray for laborers, we pray for God to move, but then we also got to get busy looking for the laborers. Now, the disciples, I mean, you've probably heard me talk about this before, the disciples necessarily in that context weren't necessarily the laborers, they were supposed to go and find the sons of peace. They were supposed to go and find the laborers who were all, that, that God was raising up in the field where they're going, right? But you pray for laborers and then you go find them. So we pray for a job crisis to be rectified, but then we go start businesses that employ people. Right? It's both and. Right? We we pray for government to be righteous, but then we get involved in government. Right? We, We pray for healing in the medical realm, but then we get involved in the medical realm and we pray as we're practicing medicine. I love, there's, there's, uh, there's a group of doctors that are connected to Global Awakening, uh, Randy Clark's ministry, where they're, they're saying, listen, we, we, want to, we want to quantify this. We want to quantify miracles happening. And, and, and we're going to still do the whole doctor bit. We're still going to do all of, all of modern medicine, but we're going to pray too. And we're going to see what happens. Why not? I mean, hospitals started with the church, right? Modern medicine, many, in many ways, was a result of Christians and believers. Anyway, okay. You get the point, right? 
Say, yes, Merle, move on. We get the point. <laughs> All right. Jesus. Okay. Because of God's work, we have authority to cast out demons. We have authority to speak in new tongues, to not be hurt by serpents and poison, and to lay hands on the sick and see them recover. That's what Matthew chapter six, uh, 16, verses 15 to 18 says. And he said to them, go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned, and these signs will follow those who believe in my name. They will cast out demons, which means you have a spiritual authority over demonic powers and principalities. They will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents, and if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. That's our job as believers. Even if there's a pandemic happening, I love, I, we were talking with Jessica Tate uh, last week after the service, and she was like, you know, it was so annoying because uh, when she was working in Brazil, she was working a, a part of a, a really big Baptist church, amazingly. Because uh, Baptists don't really believe in women in ministry <laughs> or the gifts of the Holy Spirit all the time. So like, she, she was a part of a, a really huge Baptist birth, uh, church in Brazil. And she said, you know, our prayer ministers, they had to have, by law, they were, they were forced to have a full hazmat suit on. And I'm like, wow. You know what I was impressed with? The fact that they still had prayer ministers. With all of that, because they believe in prayer. They believe in the laying on of hands. And that doesn't stop because of pandemic. Sure, we'll do whatever we need to do, but we believe what the Word of God says. Right? Like, wow, come on. All right, uh, worship team, you can come. If you would be so kind to help uh, land this sermon this morning. So the purpose of encountering God is not to use Him for our benefits, but rather to be obedient to Him, to receive direction from Him, and to stand in obedience I want to go through the last thing here of what types of things can hinder prayer. Because sometimes, sometimes people are praying and they don't see results from their prayers or they don't encounter God in prayer and they don't realize that they're actually doing something in their life that might hinder their prayer life. I want to go through. Biblically, I want to give you some scriptures here for what hinders prayer. Proverbs 21, verse 13, it says, Whoever closes his ear to the cry of the poor will himself call out and not be answered. Whoever closes his ear to the cry of the poor. So that causes, our, that causes prayers not to be heard, especially when you, you know, you're crying out for finances or whatever. All right? James chapter 4, verse 3, it says, you ask what you do not receive because you ask wrongly that you may spend it on your passions. That causes our prayers to be hindered. 1 Peter 3, 7 says, Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since, they're, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. Husbands, how you treat your wife can hinder your prayers. <laughs> if you're not honoring your wife, there can be something hindering your prayer life. That was a really good spot for all the, all the wives to be like, amen. <laughs> Psalm 66 verse 18 says this, if I had cherished iniquity in my heart, if I had cherished sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. There's times where the Bible also says in, in, in another place that your sin has separated you from God. So if there's unrepentant sin in our life, it impedes our prayer life. The last thing I want to talk about this morning is offense. Matt, still uh, you know, a couple weeks ago, preached a really good sermon on offense. Offense can hinder our prayer life. Mark chapter 11, verse 25, it says, and whenever you stand praying, forgive. If you have anything against anyone, 
so that your Father also who is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. Those are things that hinder prayer. There's things that can hinder our prayer. So it's not just a blanket statement that prayer works. <laughs> Standing in relationship with God, living out the life he has called us to live, prayer works. But we, when we're not, when our life isn't practically backing up our prayers, right, when, when we have a disconnect there, or we're just capitulating to whatever circumstances we find ourselves in, and we say, oh, whatever will be, will be. We're not holding the line in the spirit realm. We're not holding the line in our natural realm, in, in, in our lives, of what's allowed and what's disallowed in our families. When we're not enforcing the boundaries of the word of God, our prayers many times never get out of the room. And God hears us. He's, he's gracious. Listen, God, God's not like, well, you know, looking for reasons not to hear prayers, okay? But what happens is when you grow, you expect older children, mature children, to have some things figured out. Right? And I think that can happen in the kingdom of God, too. When God says, listen, I've called you to obey. If you're not obedient, then your prayer life is being affected. Can we stand together? So when we talked about the will of God, like Thelema and, and Bulamai, and, and there are things that God has willed for us, but it's Many times we only receive them because we stand in, to engage and in agreement with his word. And we learn to fight for his kingdom to come in our generation. Say, God, let, this is what Jesus taught us to pray. Let your kingdom come and let your will be done on the earth as it is in heaven. That, and that's how God writes us in to his eternal will and purpose. He writes us in to what he has determined beforehand. He writes that into our lives where he has a determined will. But he's saying those who stand in righteousness, those who walk with me in obedience, those who walk with me, they get to receive all that is, that is there that I've determined beforehand. I know when we talk about salvation, we talk about predetermination, you know, the, the whole thing that people say, well, God knows if I'm saved or not. <laughs> well, he does know, but the Bible says that you can know, too. Peter write, says, I, I write these things so that you may know, or John says, I write these things so that you may know that you have eternal life. And this is what, it, it's very similar when we talk about praying God's will and all these things, it, it's, it's, it's like Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Heavenly Father except through him, right? Right? So God's will, predetermined from the beginning of time, is that all who are in Jesus receive salvation. Right? That's God's predetermined will. It's up to us whether we are in Christ or not. It's like, and, and so sometimes people say, Oh, you know, it, it, God determined it. No. He gives you an opportunity to come into alignment with him or not. It's like if we would say, these two sections of seats, we're taking everybody to Disney World. Right? Just these two sections. And it's up to you whether you want to get out of your chairs and join these two sections or not. That's up to you. But these two sections, those who are in Christ, are receiving salvation. And that's how God writes you into his eternal will. So it is determined, but yet you have an option to join. That's the same as our prayer life, but also salvation. If you're here and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, 
you've never actually accepted the provision that God has made for you to come into relationship with him, today's your day. Don't let another day pass without being in Christ, without coming into a place that God has prepared for you in him. Maybe you've walked away from Christ. Today's a day for you to come back. Those of you who are online, maybe you're hearing me. Today's a day for you to come back if you walked away from Christ. It's also a day to come back into obedience and into alignment with God's will for your life if, if you realize that you've been just living for yourself. Yeah. <laughs> Let's pray. If that's you, I invite you to pray with me. Just pray a simple prayer. It's not about my prayer, and it's not about you saying the words that I say. It's about your heart before your heavenly Father. To simply say, Father, I come to you today. In every area in my life that is out of alignment with your will, that's out of alignment with your word, I want to bring it into your will. And so today I surrender. I ask that you would forgive me of all the wrong things that I have done, all the sin in my life. I thank you that you wash me clean today. Today I put my life in your hands. And I ask that you would fill me with your spirit. And that you would lead me in obedience to you. Thank you for the provision of the cross where Jesus died for my sins. Thank you that he rose again from the grave. And that in his life, I have life. Jesus' name. Amen. Father, I pray for every person here today, God. As we talk about encountering you in prayer, Lord, there's so much that this implies in our lives. And Lord, I pray, Father, that there the fire of the Holy Spirit would come and stir a passion for your work passion for obedience to your word, a passion to see your kingdom come and to your will be done, being done in the earth, a passion for involvement, a passion, Father, for seeing your presence invade Lidditz and Mannheim, Lancaster County, Lebanon County. Father, we ask for this. Father, that we wouldn't just encounter your presence for goosebumps, but we would encounter your presence so that change and revival would come in our land because that's what we need, God. That hearts would come into alignment with your will. So, Father, I pray, Lord, for emboldened testimonies of every person here, emboldened testimonies of your work in our lives. so that those who are outside who might be rejecting you would be ready to receive you at a moment's notice. In Jesus' name. Thank you so much for watching this teaching. I hope that it impacted you in some way. If you enjoyed this teaching and would like more teachings like this, feel free to subscribe to our YouTube channel and get updated each time we post a new sermon.